Well, hello, 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 everybody. Happy Saturday, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Dave Riccio, here along with Matt Allen, and we are your KTA, KTAR car guys. Heard here every Saturday from 11 to noon on News 92.3 KTAR. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. If you got car questions, we've got answers. So we encourage you to give us a call and give us a call early at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. You can also reach us by text is another way to get a hold of the show at 411-923. Again, 411-923. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, a little bit of fact or fiction in regard to fuel economy, open phones, and does your shop use quality auto parts, and is there a difference between quality and non-quality auto parts, and how do you know? Because every advertisement I've ever seen is we got quality auto parts. How can they all have quality? What's the difference? Well, it depends on what you're looking at, Dave. Now, if the question was, does your shop, if you're asking me, does your shop use quality auto parts? Well, of course we do. <laughs> right, that's what we're we're in business to do. We're the best, right? But uh, I think the question was to the consumer: Is your shop that you're going to using parts? Well, you don't. How do you know unless you ask? I mean, everybody says so. Well, you got to ask, and I think the consumers don't realize is that when we call the parts house, we don't stock a lot of parts other than brake pads and some belts and some air filters and oil filters common stuff, but we're not going to stock an alternator on our shelf anymore. We're going to pick up the phone or we're going to call vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, and we're going to look, you know, it depends on who's selling it and costing and estimating. What are they looking for? Are they looking for the best value for you, the best value for them? What what's People don't realize how many choices we have, even on a set of brake pads. I can buy a $10 set of brake pads. I can buy the same brake pads for 50 bucks if I want to. Well, yeah, but it's a different recipe. I mean, you're like you said, Dave, brakes is a prime example. There's $99 brake jobs out there. Well, there's advertised $99 brake jobs. There really isn't such a <laughs> such a thing or maybe the 159, but those people in that store uh that do that type of work, maybe your chain environment, they're a I, buy low, sell high. They're they're a, a mass merchant merchandiser, if you will. So maybe the brake pad that I mean, we can look up, like you said, for a Honda Accord, you can get a brake pad wholesale cost anywhere from twelve dollars to to probably sixty dollars wholesale cost. Well, I made this and, mistake as a young store manager at a tire shop. I was twenty one years old, and I managed in a store, and I would price out parts and I would sell parts and then I would always call around and look for just the best price. That was most important to me. It would save the consumer some money, you know, and also there was a little more room for margin and, and in that environment we were driven by a corporate margin. You must have parts margin, you know. And so that's that's how I did it. At twenty one I didn't know any better, but when I started to get to know these customers and started to see them come back a year later, a year and a half later and they have a problem with something I just worked on, it started to bother me. <laughs> Okay, so how how do you know then, Dave? Or I mean, is is a what's the question that a customer? Uh, you know, I call somebody. This is Matt from Virginia Auto Service, Sally, and we're going to do this in your car, and you need a timing belt or you need a water pump. How is she supposed to ask me? Are you using good parts? I mean, does it? What's the question? What's well, I think the question could be? Okay, you guys are going to put a water pump on my car. And when you guys are shopping for a water pump for my car, why did you pick this particular band of water pump and tell me about it? I think right. you can ask that question. Well, but, you know, I, that consumer is not going to know the brand. I'm going to give them a name. They've mm -hmm. never heard this name before. It's not on the shelf at uh, Walmart or, or Checker or, or wherever. This is the original supplier to Honda. So uh, it has nothing to do with the name. What were your choices? Well, I had choice X, Y, Z was this much. I had choice this much. You know, these are the three choices I had as the auto shop when I was shopping for that part. And I like this one because I'm familiar with the brand. Mm -hmm. They're well established. And their price it feels very value. You know, it's got value to it. I don't feel like I'm just getting a, you know, cheap garbage. Well, you know, even for my personal stuff, I could shop for three things get three bids for the same thing my nature is i'm gonna kind of want to go maybe i'm a little silly naive if it's expensive it must be better yeah it's implied value and and there's some of that there too so when we we're gonna pull up and look at these parts for your car i'm gonna pick the brand that i maybe i'm not always price driven and sometimes it is if i first i'm gonna look for what is the proper part for your car what's the best part and then 
maybe there's two brands and maybe there's a four or five dollar price difference and, and I'm equally like and I'm satisfied with the quality of either brand, I'll go with the lesser expensive one. Or again, once I identify the part that you need, maybe I like that brand. So I might shop around and see if I get that brand from one of my suppliers a little bit different to save you money. But my shopping is always driven around what's going to do the best job for the customer. And then at my shop, we give a two-year warranty, parts and labor. So if I use a bad part, you're eating it. I'm eating the labor, and twice. I don't like the taste of labor when I have to eat it. A little bit like well, pro. you you bring something up that's I think uh, is warranty and quality are they synonymous? No, they're not. Because I mean, I see, I hear some people in town, some chains, advertising lifetime warranty, fix it forever. That's, you know, that's hokey baloney. Hokey baloney. <laughs> I, well, even... I think you're, I think you're, you generally are paying extra. So for for some of the auto shops and some of the vendors we work with. They'll put on a cheap part because they know that the vendor A has to stand behind it, and they know that the vendor pays them labor in some cases. So why not put on the cheap part? Well, but it's also maybe the way that that chain store or that large group of franchise, that's their model. Uh, I used to work at a chain store, and you're making me feel dirty right well, now. Well, you, you've <laughs> showered and cleaned since, since then. You, you've redeemed yourself since those, since the, those days. But... You know, we may price a, a job. Let's just price a job, and it's a thousand dollars. And then we get compared to one of those stores, and their job is a thousand dollars. Also, are they the same? No. Uh, well, in some cases they might be. Maybe they're different. But let's talk about front end work. You can buy ball joints of a Moog brand or a higher end quality. You can buy the white box stuff. That same part, sixty seventy percent less. Hundred percent. I mean, not hundred percent less, but you know, a forty-five dollar part. I know I can find that same ball joint in a Acme brand for thirteen bucks. Right. Do you want it? No, but that might be the one that they sell because they have to have these larger margins. They're you know they've got so many layers of management and these people, and that model fits them. The older I get, the more I just want to do stuff once. I don't want to do it twice, so quality does become an issue with me. I do have customers ask, you know, is this a, is this a good quality part? I had one guy specifically uh, when I was very first at Tri-City Transmission. Uh, he, we were doing U-joints for him, and he said, is that a, is that a, he wanted AC Delco U-joints. And I had bought a U-joint from XYZ, Acme Auto Parts, whatever, and it really looked crummy. And then I got an AC Delco one, and I put it side by side. And the AC Delco one, man, it was thicker. You know, the grease hole in the middle was mm-hmm. actually – it was a smaller hole, which was actually more thickness in the journal, you know. So it was a nicer piece. It was piece. probably machined out where the other one's got boogers in it. And it's, yeah, you know. it was a way nicer piece, you know. So I have had customers ask, and that is a good question because here's the thing. If you start – you're going to start really starting to do repairs on your car, 60, 70, 80,000 miles. You're starting to spend money, maybe getting a water pump maybe getting this or that, if every time you put a cheap part on your car, it's, the, the car's just getting degraded as we go because now you've got to repair this really not, you know, it's like, oh, the first one lasted 60, so the one we replace it with is going to last another 60,000 miles. Not necessarily. Uh, you know, you can put on cheap parts. And that's where the other question comes in. We were talking a little bit about the show, original equipment, OEM. You know, so if you've got a Honda car, you can go, buy a Honda radiator and put in a Honda radiator. Well, there is no such thing as a Honda radiator. Because they don't make that's, radiators, that's, right? Yeah. Honda, I always say it. Honda doesn't make anything. They design a car. They ask everybody else to make the parts. All these suppliers and vendors make the parts, deliver them to Honda. They put all this recipe together, throw it in the oven, bam, and bam, out comes an Accord. <laughs> that's what Honda makes. Right. I don't make flour, and I don't make sugar or vanilla, but I can make cookies. Well, there's original so. equipment parts, and there's original equipment suppliers. Yes. So we can literally look at a, a water pump for a Toyota, and there's a water pump on the right, water pump on the left. They're identical with the exception of a Toyota logo. That is the only difference. I'll, I'll try to abbreviate my story and since you, you know, only have a second. but Long-winded. Perfect, perfect case. A Mini Cooper, a friend's shop. Can't figure out what having all these problems. This car's been to the dealer, it's been to another shop, and it, it finally ends up at my friend's shop. And he's checking it out, and he just can't. Nothing makes sense. He can't figure it out. So they said, "Well, heck with it. We're going to take it to Mini. We're going to pay the supposed experts to diagnose this car." So they do that. Uh, try and shorten up this story. They say, "You've got a bad master of flow sensor. Go put a new one on. That'll solve your problem." He does that. Takes the car back to the shop. 
calls up the supplier, gets a, a Bosch mass airflow sensor, puts it on, problem isn't solved, goes back to the dealer. They said, well, that's the problem. You didn't use the mini mass <laughs> airflow sensor. So we go up there with the Bosch part to the parts department and then go to uh, and they say, hey, go get your mini part. It comes out of the mini box. Right. Well. They're identical. Well, yeah, or we could say, well, you gave it up, Dave, but – Take those two parts, and the parts guy's going, no, this one's the better one. Put them behind your back, mix them around, say, okay, now, Smarty, which one was yours? He can't tell the difference because it's the same damn part. Well, we've got Mary and Bruce in open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen, and we are here taking car questions, educating you on your car, Telling you when a, you want a good part, when you want a bad part. Do you ever want a bad part? Uh, well, I don't ever want a bad one. Is there times when you want a cheap one, I guess? Maybe you're my, selling the car. My favorite when, show, because we're talking about warranty being synonymous with quality, was uh, Tommy Boy. You know, he's walking through the parts place, and he says, well, we just want warranty marked on the box. He says, you know, I can take a dump in a box and put a warranty on it if you want, <laughs> but I'd rather buy, you know, sell you a quality product. So well, it's just a, that's a classic line. Well, there, and there's certain, yeah, the warranty doesn't mean anything, there, when, especially when there's complicated labor involved, mm. alternator, and there's, a, I mean, there's just so many differences. You get a remanufactured alternator or you get a rebuilt alternator. Some people call it semantics, but a... You know, there's suppliers out there, and you can go buy an alternator. And what they did is they took it and they fixed it. You're right. But they didn't replace the bearings. They didn't replace the whatever because they weren't wrong. But those aren't universal terms. So remanufactured is not set up by the federal government. I mean, no one knows what that is. It's totally set up by the guy selling it. So we're going to go with Mary in Gilbert on a 2013 Duramax. Go ahead, Mary. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Um, my husband got in a car accident a couple months ago. A lady ran a red light and um, pretty much destroyed the front of our dually truck. And then the shop realized that the frame had been bent, so they had to order a new frame from Detroit. And we haul big loads of horses with this truck, and I'm just wondering if there's any concerns I need to have you know, once it's once we eventually get it back to us, if if there's going to be any trouble with hauling with it, I don't. Doesn't sound like they would put a whole new frame under a truck. Maybe a section of frame. No, I've seen those whole frames. They, it's the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, they it, had ordered from Detroit, and it's been in the shop two months. Mm. Well, I, it, I don't think that there's anything necessarily specific that you need to be. That you need to be worried about. I, I think it's one of those uh, cases where when you get it fixed, you just drive it and you document and you listen for rattles, listen for squeaks, and, and try and notice if there was things that are happening now that weren't there before. There is a lot. I mean, that's a lot of work. A lot of a nuts lot and bolts, a lot of, of ground wires, a lot of everything. I mean, if anything, I'd be down there at the dealership drop or wherever the body shop is dropping off cookies and saying, hey, <laughs> take your time, do the best job you can do on this car. I'm in no hurry, you know, because you got to know the insurance company at the other end is pushing those guys, get these guys out of here, get them out of here. Yeah, they're they're in a rental car. car. They're hurrying them through this process. And and, and so rather than worry, I might just go uh, – I don't want them to take so long when they forgot where the bolts went from taking it apart. <laughs> right, but if <laughs> extra I don't parts, know. You don't that want is to be, a job that's going to have a few extra parts when it's all. You said don't and want done. to be down there harassing them, <laughs> but at the same point, I think you can play well, nice with them, I guess, and maybe uh, coach them into doing doing it to the T's, I guess. Thanks so much for the call, Mary. Six zero two two seven seven five eight two seven. 602-277-KTR. We're going to go with Jay in Phoenix on a 2003 Honda Accord. Go ahead, Jay. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Right. So I just brought my car into the, the dealership, and they're telling me that I need to get a new power steering pump. And the, the rocket science I am when it comes to car repairs, you know, how do you know, number one, is it legit? Two, you know, is it worth paying um, dealer prices as opposed to going to 
somewhere else now that I've listened to what you're talking about quality parts. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's, we could probably finish our segment with this question, Dave, because it goes a couple things. So I want to ask you, why was the car at the repair shop for service? Does it have any, oh. did it have a leak? Did you know something? Is there a noise or just a simple oil change? It was a simple oil change. Okay. Got a coupon and said, oh, let me go there and get it done. Sure. Well, I mean, that's what we're all in business to do. We're here to fix cars. We send out advertisements too for oil changes. We want to have an opportunity to introduce you to our service. And then we're going to look at your car. Bend over and I'll show you. Sorry. <laughs> you know, we're going to we're going to look at your car and then let you know what it needs. That's our responsibility. In the absence of seeing drips on the ground or having to add fluid, I think that's when you ask the questions. And you say, well, Mr. Service Advisor, I don't have any symptoms. I don't, can you show me? Maybe you're at the shop. They can demonstrate to you this, this, uh, this power steering link. Or you say, what's the consequence of not doing it? Or you go to bumper to bumper radio dot com and you find, find another shop, shop. And, and maybe you go get a second opinion, especially if there's no relationship here in the absence of any symptoms. But I, I to- like leaks being defined. I think as consumers, you should ask how severe the leak is. You know, because you know we rate leaks on a scale of one to five. Five, it's like pouring out. It's like a horrible hurricane. One, a little bit of dusting around the seal. Not a big deal. So when does a leak become an issue? So that's a good question. When somebody says, hey, you got a leak from your power steering pump, therefore we want to replace it. And last I checked, I thought the Honda dealer was just resealing those power steering pumps on top of the toolbox. Well, they are. It's common for the front seal on the power steering pump to replace to uh, leak, and you can replace those in the car still. There's an O-ring on the Hondas on the very top. And i got to tell you, I, I hate to beat up on the dealers, but sometimes I like to. Auto repair is very subjective, and th- I think the bigger the place, uh, the work you need depends on how busy they are. I, mean, I, I hate to even go down that road at times, but I've done lots of second opinions from in my shop from dealers that are close to my shop, and if you know where my shop is, you can read between the lines, and we look at this stuff, and mm. man, it's a stretch. Well, I think yeah. you know, people always say, you know, I don't know anything about cars, and that's the point of this show. I mean, you gotta you got to learn something about it, at least so you know how to <clears throat> excuse me, communicate and ask good questions and feel comfortable about spending the money. Why, explain to me why I need to spend this money. And feel free to have them show you. Can you show me what's going on? And you can, you can still, even though you don't know anything about cars or anything like that, just by looking, even if you didn't walk away knowing anything more about it, you've seen something, it's now familiar, you now know what you're spending money on. Because we sell an invisible product. You know, you have no idea what was done in your car. All you know is I, I like the guy. He seems nice. He seems reasonable. He always takes care of all my concerns. But otherwise, he's selling you a completely invisible product. There's nothing you can see. You know, if your car just came in on a tow truck and it doesn't move, well, we know it drives away. You know, we know something happened. But really, what happened? Well, yeah, I mean, there's uh, oftentimes your car can be in a shop and it drove in in the morning and maybe you just got service work done in maintenance. It's very tough at times for a consumer to even recognize that there was anything done. They just know they spent money. That's <laughs> what, you know the, the perceived value. Well, when we come but, back, I want to talk about some of the parts you absolutely cannot skimp on. You know, motor mounts being one of them, catalytic converters. We're going to tell you why. So we've got Roger up on the line, and we've got other open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You can also get a hold of us, text 411-923. And bumper2bumperradio.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you're looking for a shop or just have a question uh, that you didn't come up with during the show. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are helping you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon. And I must say, during the break, I heard a commercial for Virginia Auto Service with Victoria. I'm sure she's a sweet lady, but if I have to hear that commercial <laughs> one more time, I'm going to start telling people not to go to Virginia uh, Auto Service. Come on, Please Dave. Please change that. I'm not changing it. Victoria's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> what is it about the English accent that makes you listen? You know, you're like, it's like the voice of authority. That's right. Something like that. Hey, we have, you know, we we're talking about what are the parts that you can't skimp on or not skimp on but where do you want to really stick with like a uh original equipment part something made by the manufacturer and and one of those you're contradicting yourself the manufacturer doesn't make anything 
one supplied by the manufacturer's vendor to be original equipment on the car. <laughs> okay. okay. You mean like me. Is it words Semantics. Or? Yes. But there's a, a question that was text that people have a, a Jeep Compass, 19 or 2007 Compass, and when she comes to a stoplight, I'm assuming she, I don't know why, uh, comes to a stoplight, the car shakes. You put it in neutral, and it's nice and smooth. That is the classic symptom of having a, a bad engine mount, whether it's, just you call it grounded dave but there's just no cushioning or or absorption ability left in the mount or they're broken so all those harmonic vibrations instead of being cushioned by the rubber they're being transferred through the frame and you feel that in the in the chassis or or in the passenger compartment well i'm gonna agree with you it looks like female uh font across (laughs) the text but that's one of the things where it is absolutely i've never seen an aftermarket mount that is any good I just haven't seen one. There, there isn't. So when you're at the auto shop with your compass, and uh, if you need one, bumper to bumper com. But when you're there and you're going to get it mounts replaced, you want the the ones from they got the Chrysler logo on them. That is absolutely one place you do not want to skip out and go out with some other manufacturer. Yeah, that that's one of another. Uh, Dave, the last gentleman that called with the Honda question was talking a little bit about um, quality of parts and maybe it's an older car. Do I really need to get the dealer part or can I get an aftermarket part? Well, in his case, the power steering pump, there's nobody making a power steering pump for that car. That was manufactured the first time by whoever supplied that to Honda. And then from now on, those get rebuilt. So you won't be able to go buy an aftermarket uh, power steering pump for that car. And if it was my car... And that was the original pump. If you're at the right shop, a lot of people will just replace the one seal or we take those apart and rebuild them ourselves. Hmm. I would much rather do that than get one from a big nationwide remanufacturer where they're just running down the line. They're just putting miscellaneous parts in them. Every part in your pump is matched together. So you're really not going to get aftermarket necessarily in that case. You could, but power steering hoses might be another thing tied to that job, Dave. Yeah, the other ones work, but, man, the Honda ones fit so much better. You'll fight putting an aftermarket mm. one on there, but the Honda one just bolts right up. and Go with the Honda one in that cake, case, so. for sure. But you don't have to be at a dealer to get an original equipment part. It's They're accessible. I mean, the, the manufacturers make money selling cars. They also make money selling parts. So we're going to go with Roger in Payson on a 2006 PT Cruiser. Go ahead, Roger. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, right. I got a kind of unusual problem. I know you guys got all the brains to solve it. <laughs> I, I start the car up, and I'll drive it maybe a mile or a mile and a half. Battery light comes on. Huh. Okay. Shut the car off. It'll stay off. I took it. I had the battery checked. It's good. Uh, alternator, but not uh, 14.25. That's good. And uh, it'll maybe not do it for another day or so, or... Maybe immediately later after. That's one problem. Let's see if these other ones were associated with two other ones. Uh, shut the car off, and the lights will come on. I have to physically, you know, turn them back off. That's when you turn the lights on and you, you know, turn them off, shut the ignition off, the lights will come back on. That's number two. Number three, ignition key out of the ignition. I'll tap the steering wheel, right? Interior lights will come on. Now, mm. if the key is in ignition, the ignition is on, I can do the same thing, and they won't come on. Okay, your problem now. <laughs> Tell me what to do about <laughs> it. <laughs> well, it's a good thing you don't live in Phoenix. <laughs> right, right. I don't want you coming to my shop. <laughs> no, I, it, it, it sounds like they can all kind of be related. I mean, when, when I think of Chrysler's and battery lights and alternator lights and stuff like that, I'm, I'm thinking of connections at the battery, bad grounds possibly in the engine compartment, things like that. Start to do weird things. Yeah, start. With, I started originally thinking maybe a computer issue. I'm pretty sure on the PT Cruiser that the computer is the voltage regulator for mm. that charging system, and that could be an intermittent problem. But then we start with these gremlins with that, you know, the dash light coming on and the or maybe the ignition switch problem. He's banging on the steering wheel, and also the lights are flipping on. Yeah, you could try maybe manipulating that ignition switch. You know, get it to where you start, and it's back in the neutral or, or just run position, and maybe wiggle it forward, wiggle it back, and see if that can affect anything. But I'm thinking they could very well be related to body control module mm. or some kind of. Right. There's Loose. some common denominator somewhere. Loose nut behind the wheel. Sorry about that, Roger. <laughs> Appreciate the phone call. 602-277-5827.
Looks like we've got Joel in Mesa on a 2011 GMC Sierra. Go ahead, Joel. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm having a problem. I took my truck to an auto body shop and had some work on, done on it. Um, I got in an accident. I took the truck to the shop the insurer told me to go to. It was their shop. So I got a lifetime warranty from the insurance company and from the shop. But the problem is it had to do with my my rear bumper. And I have backup sensors on it. So now the sensors aren't working properly. They do sometimes. And then sometimes they'll just beep for no reason. Just put it in reverse and it'll just start beeping on me. It'll tell me that uh, the backup sensor is off on my computer, up front by my gauges. And um, it, it happens. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens frequently enough to bother me. And at the same time, now I can't trust my backup sensor because it's not working properly. Um, I've tried to call them about it. The problem is, is it's hard to diagnose because it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, so I'm having a problem with that. And I was going to take my truck down to the dealer to have something else looked at before the warranty runs out. And I tried to call the insurance company to get, um, you know, to see if the dealer could take a look at it because I've taken it back to the shop twice now. And now the insurance company is not calling me back. So I'm just wondering, you know, what do I do to get this fixed? I got a lifetime warranty with both of them, but the, the problem's kind of hard to diagnose. Right. Well, I mean, on, on that deal, the bottom line in my book is it wasn't broken before you got the accident. The insurance company is responsible to make you whole again, whether it's your insurance company needs to go fight with the other insurance company or if it's the other insurance company you're dealing with. I, I'm not quite sure. Um, but they need to fix it. So maybe you write a letter to the insurance company I went where you told me to go. Mm. They're unable to fix my car, or they're not participating in fixing it because they're not calling me back. Uh, so you've got to help me. And, Hold on. And, and so you, maybe you you write a letter to the adjuster. Most of those adjusters now, we fortunately, thank God, we don't deal with insurance very much. But lately, I've noticed you leave a voicemail with an adjuster. It says, I'll reach you within 24 hours, and if you're not satisfied, my boss's phone number is. Call mm. the boss. Find out. Better Business Bureau, I guess, could... Uh, you run into a problem bought. you cannot fix. I think if they want to fix it, they get it fixed. Who, the shop? Yeah, the shop, sure. Well, yeah, but you know what? They work for the insurance company. Uh, lifetime warranty. I don't know. We're, well, I want to. I want to. I want to go off on this. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. I got a box over here. When you call your insurance company and you've been in an accident, they're gonna say you. We've got a. We've got a body shop right down the street from you. Please don't feel like you got to go to that body shop. That's the body shop they've worked out a deal with, so it's not necessarily going to be the body shop that's going to work the best for you. It's just a, it's a fundamental problem to go to a body shop that is in cahoots with your insurance company. So you should go out and find a body shop that has got a good reputation, been in a business a long time, and you get a voicemail that they respond to you. So go shopping. If you need a body shop, I can guarantee you there's three great body shops at BumperToBumperRadio.com. These are guys who are going to work for you, not just the insurance company. So you don't have to go where they recommend it. Whether it's your insurance or the other insurance company, you can take it anywhere you want, and you need to go shopping for a body shop. You know, it saves you time because it's an easy answer. Well, these guys are good yeah. because my insurance company says they're good. Yeah, well, that's what they think. It's kind of like the guy with the tow truck that shows up. That you know, <laughs> go here, go here. But while we're since we're on the body shop and you're still standing on your soapbox lightly, Dave, I'll <laughs> step up on <laughs> my soapbox is taller. I'll, by the way. I'll step up on mine a little bit, and this and it goes with Joel's truck as well, but even more so with Mary who called in earlier with the dually that's getting a frame. That's probably if that's a thirty five hundred dually with a Duramax, I'm betting that's a fifty or sixty thousand dollar truck. And the insurance companies don't like this term, but it's called diminished value. So Mary, hopefully you're still listening, and Joel, should depending on the extent of the damage, you should ask your insurance company or if you have an attorney because you're you were rear ended, I would assume at that rate there's probably some some injuries. But you want to ask them up about the diminished value. And what that is, that's just saying, hey, whether it's four years from now, 10 years from now, whatever time you go to sell this truck, if mm -hmm. you compare that to the identical truck that just wasn't wrecked, there's going to be a difference in value. Everything could be the same on those two trucks, but one was wrecked and one wasn't. Mm -hmm. There's a diminishment of value there. Maybe it's $2,000, maybe it's $5,000. 
that insurance company should be paying you for that. So that's one Question thing to check into. Question worth asking for. Asking for Let me ask you something about diminished value. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got Steve, we've got another Roger, we've got Bob and Paul, but it's time for fact or fiction. Is that right? A little bit of, right? of, of fact. going to hit your button or anything? No fact no or whatever? Well, wait a minute. Hold on. Give me a second. No, it's too complicated. So fact or got, fiction. Dude? You know, I pulled this one off of the uh, those car guys, the ones that are funny. <laughs> <laughs> the NPR. Uh, replacing the air filter on your car will improve your gas mileage. Fact or fiction? You no, know, Dave, I can't ever give a yes or no <laughs> answer because that's not a yes or no question, right? <laughs> right. Uh, I will just say for simple terms, yes. But if I really wanted to pick on you, I guess I would have to ask you, if, uh, is it dirty? Because if I change a clean one, it probably isn't going to make a difference. Well, how dirty? Well, according to, and everything the government tells me is true, but according to the U.S. Department of Energy, air filter will, will mostly help you with acceleration. Very little fuel savings. Now, is that a fact or fiction? I don't know. <laughs> So if it's coming out of whitehouse.gov, it must be true, right? For the price of an air filter, you know, it's it's good for your car to have a good air filter in there. That's me. That means you're buying one once a year, twice a year if you like to d- drive through dust storms and haboobs. Anyway, when we come back, we've got Steve, Roger, Bob, and Paul. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to you the stole final my voice, segment. Of, were you going to talk? <clears throat> you taking me. my limelight. <laughs> Bumper to Bumper Radio, where we're taking your phone calls, helping you with any questions you might have in regard to auto repair, taking texts. I'm reading a text here. This gentleman has a 2002 Denali, owned it with 50K, has 90K on it now. First gear is slipping when it wants cold or hot. Never changed the fluid, still pink, smells really good. So I would say, why do you think your transmission's slipping? I'll have 10 customers tell me a transmission's slipping, and it means 10 different things to 10 different people every time. If that happens to be a half ton and it has a 4L60 in it, rarely do they lose first gear. It's not very common for it. So we need to find out. You can have a misfire, feel like a slip off the line. You can have different things going on that, that make you think you have a transmission issue. One of the key indicators is the oil. If it still smells good, it doesn't have a crispy or a bad barbecue day smell to it, and it's nice and red, it's never been serviced in 90,000 miles, I'm thinking your transmission's not slipping. What do you think, Matt? Uh, I'm not paying me. attention, Dave. Okay. No, uh, <laughs> well, same thing. It's, there's so many different things that it could be, and, and you're right. There, People go to a transmission right away. So they always go there first. The neighbor said, or Bob had the same problem with his car, so that must be the same thing with mine. (laughs) We do a lot of motor mounts at Tri-City Transmission, and people always think it's slipping right off the line in first gear because the left motor mount is broken. And the first thing the the car does, as soon as you give it gas, where there's an action, there's a reaction, the motor pops up by, you know, three inches. And that feels like a slip, you know. But once they get going, the clunk that the engine is coming back down. Should give it away that it's a motor mount, but that's one that happens all the time. Dave, one more text. A gentleman writes in uh, 2006 Mitsubishi. He's got a service engine soon light on. It comes on, then it goes off. He's had it to a couple different shops. One says it needs an oxygen sensor. The other one says it needs a new catalytic converter. But then also, they told me that my battery is only cranking so many amps and it needs to be XYZ or whatever the number Mm -hmm. is. Batteries cause... So he says, where where do I start? I would start with a battery. Uh, The battery has – just because a battery starts a car does not necessarily mean that that it's going to run all the electronics properly. We see a lot in Later the model of the car, the worse it is. The battery has got to be on the money. The connection has got to be good. And just because it starts doesn't mean it's good. That's the hard one. You've got to tell people they got a bad battery. What do you mean? Start it up. I drove here. What are you talking about? i got a bad battery. You know, well, they just don't want to believe you. Right. <laughs> and the way that the, those sensors are working, the catalytic converter, there's a sensor before and a sensor after. That's monitoring what's happening, what's going into the catalytic converter, and now it knows what's coming out. And it wants to see a difference in those two. And there's some fairly simple tests that can be done to determine if you have a bad catalytic converter or if you have a bad oxygen sensor. Sometimes when you replace the converter, you need to replace the oxygen sensors also. And you've got to remember, too, if that catalytic converter is bad, something caused it to go wrong. You have to fix the other problem, too, or you'll be putting a new converter on it again. Catalytic converters is one of those I do not recommend going with aftermarket. It'll save you a ton of money. 
it's because there's a ton of stuff left out of it, platinum, that type of thing. So you're not really saving anything. It's going to last you a year, maybe two, but you're going to go back with the little yellow light on again. I thought I already had that fixed. So get a good factory catalytic converter. Yeah. Even though they don't make them at the factory, maybe they do. I don't know. <laughs> so we're going to go with Roger on a 2004 Volkswagen Jetta. Go ahead, Roger. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Great show. Listen to you when I can. Hey, um, I have a check engine light on. I ran the diagnostic. I've got one of the, you know, the, the code readers. Um, the oxygen sensor is bad in the car. Uh, was in, stuck in traffic the other day. The car never overheats, uh, overheated, and then dropped right back down to where it was supposed to be. So is it the oxygen sensor that's doing that, or you think it's something else? Well, I want to back up a little bit. So you have a code reader, so you... You got the code. How is it that you determined that the oxygen sensor was bad? Um, the code, I mean, it read that it was giving me that warning. Mm. And do you remember what the definition of the code was? I, I don't. Okay. It, it's been a minute. Um, and I, I talked to someone else, and like, it's not super pressing. It's causing the engine to run hot. Um, I, I was just kind of thrown off. This car never overheats. Right. Well, the, how does it go from overheating to right back within like a minute? And okay. Well, the, a couple things here in your question. To the first part of the question, I think was, are the two related? And no, the oxygen sensor has nothing to do with the engine overheating. You could now. I don't know if the car boiled over or you just saw it up on the gauge. You could have a thermostat that intermittently sticks. You could have a radiator fan motor. Uh, that maybe the fan motor is going bad, and sometimes they'll stop on a bad spot, and they just won't fire up again. You can tap them or spin them, give them a little bump start, and they start going again. Could just be low on coolant, too. Could be the same, same yeah, issue. Yeah, low on coolant, or maybe that uh, relay that controls the fan. You know, the computer's looking at the – there's a temperature sensor that's in there going, hey, man, it's hot. Turn the fan on. So the fan comes on. Well, it may not be telling it it's hot down there. Maybe it doesn't know. Uh, it turned into a frog. <laughs> you make a pretty it, it good can, sensor, man. It can't man. tell the difference. But the next part is the the common misconception, false information is, I got a code for an oxygen sensor, so I've got a bad oxygen sensor. No. I would, I would say maybe three out of ten ends up being an O2 sensor. I mean, there, there's different O2 sensor codes. There's yeah. O2 sensor heater codes, which a lot of times can be an O2 sensor. And that's the one you see from the battery a lot. But the downstream O2 lean doesn't mean O2 sensor is bad. Not even close. So there's many codes for O2 sensors. Some mean certain things. But, you know, we tend to think we're going to plug in and it's going to tell us what it is. Well, and you've got to remember, that oxygen sensor, again, it's just a little dude in the exhaust. Just picture the little monkey in there going, hey... There's a lot of a lot of unburned fuel in here. Computer, give me less. So it's going back and forth. He's just the messenger. Don't chop his head off because he tells you there's a bunch of gas in there when there's. I'm not a, picturing a monkey. I'm looking at one right well, my, now. My parents used to we're tell me. We're going to sneak you know, in Bob. In the sneak in Bob on a '95 Ford Mustang. Go ahead, Bob. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Yeah, it's like a '94, '95. I'm I'm looking for a uh, transmission for it, and I didn't know if you guys had some insight where I might be able to get a possible one for it. It would be like it's a T5. Dave, that's you. World class T5. Are, is, do you have a transmission in it now, or are you looking for a replacement because you don't have one? I got the one. core. I got the core. Right. I just need the guts inside. It's really bad. Have you have you had that one taken apart and looked to rebuild that transmission you have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know any good like shops? Because I've been quoted like seventeen ninety five and. I'm just trying to get something lower. Well, Dave, I don't know if there's... right. Well, again, be careful what you shop for. Lower may not be better. Uh, it all depends on your circumstances. But, Dave, is that uh, uh, something that you guys would rebuild at Tri City Transmission? Are you building manual transmissions? Absolutely. It's it's a it's a fairly vanilla transmission. The world class T5 has been around forever. You know, parts are readily available. It's easily rebuildable. Not not a problem whatsoever. But he could have something where that one's just something happened, a bearing chewed up the case, maybe needs a core or... Something went bad. No, I, I think he just thinks he needs a whole different one. But $1,700 installed is, doesn't seem unreasonable to me for a transmission. And, and cheaper is not always better, and especially when it comes to transmissions, because of the parts and pieces, you either put in them or don't put it in them. There's, there's a lot of uh, subjectivity there. So I always tell people, if I sell you something for $10... There's nine dollars worth of stuff. The next guy down the street may sell it to you for seven, but there's only three dollars worth of stuff. 
which one's actually a better deal. So you only want to do it once, and that's the whole point of this this show is that good parts. You know, what are you really saving if you got to go do go do it again, and you or end if, up with a toe? Well, or if it doesn't last, or you don't. You know, another example, Dave, is air conditioning and radiators uh, with the condensers. A lot of shops will use a cheaper aftermarket condenser when they have to replace it because the, the original equipment or the good one is so much money, they're afraid to lose the job. So you end up with a cheaper condenser. Less your, fins air, per inch. Less fins per inch. Maybe the air conditioner doesn't cool as well. So you, maybe you gave up five degrees of cab temperature or vent temperature, but did you get a better deal? Well, thanks, you guys, for joining us. If you're looking for a great shop, bumper to bumperradio.com. We always recommend if you've already got a relationship with somebody else, stick with them. A good mechanic is somebody you want to have close to your family. Thanks, Peter, for running the dials. We'll see you next weekend. He's Matt Allen, and I'm Dave Riccio. This was Bumper to Bumper.